So in this lesson today, what we're going to start getting into is some of your safety switches and safety features that you will most likely run into on a lot of your residential light commercial uh, units. The first one that we really want to get into is your high limit switch. Now, take a look at this this device here. Um, they really are a pretty simple component in the control circuit of a gas furnace that is relatively easy to troubleshoot. When we are looking at these switches, you're going to have just two wires connected to it. You're going to have a wire connected here, and you're going to have a wire connected here. They are temperature actuated switches. It's a bimetal switch that will open if the furnace exceeds a predetermined temperature. Many of the high limit switches in a gas furnace are preset, which means we do not have the ability to adjust at what temperature that switch is going to open. We can usually find the temperature at which the switch is actually going to open by looking at the stamp that is usually located on the switch itself. So if you are ever in doubt or curious to know at what temperature the switch is going to open. You're going to have to look at that little sticker or little stamp that's going to be on that switch. They usually do open up somewhere around 200 degrees. It's pretty standard, but again, you do have different manufacturers and different types of limit switches out there. So it's always a good thing to to you know, maybe get familiar at what you're actually dealing with. You will have some high limit switches that are manual reset, and then you'll also have that are automatic reset. The picture that you see here, this is a manual reset high limit switch. How do we know that it's a manual high limit switch? It's the little red button that you see right here in the center. If this switch was to open, this little red switch in the center there will actually pop. It will actually pop up. And in order to close that switch again, you would have to push that button back in. Other high limit switches are automatic. They will not have that little red button on them. And the only way that that switch will actually close again is once the limit switch cools off below 200 degrees. Here you are, you have a roll-out switch. They look very, very similar to each other. Again, all it is going to be is just two wires connected to it, one there and one there. Again, this is a manual roll-out switch, manual reset roll-out switch. Again, what they're going to do, it's going to be a bimetal switch that's going to open if the flame rolls out and touches the switch. Your rollout switches are going to be located close to the burner itself. Your high limit switch is going to be located close to the heat exchanger because that's where the hottest temperature is going to be. So the roll-out switch is going to be located right next to or in close vicinity to your burners. Again, they can be manual reset or they can be automatic reset. If one of these roll-out switches was to uh, pop open, in this case, that little red button that you see in the image would pop up, which actually opens the switch. And in order to close that switch again, you have to push that button back in. Then you would also have a fan limit switch on some of your furnaces, especially depending on the, the style. Uh, some of your older furnaces will definitely have uh, something like this. You'll definitely see it on standing pilots. Uh, you may, may not see it on spark ignition uh, furnaces, 
But, you know, obviously, you know, pay attention to what you're dealing with and what you got going on, and usually you'll, you'll see it, and they look exactly as you see in the picture here. Uh, the fan limit switch does two things. It controls the fan and acts as a high limit switch. Your fan limit switch is two thermally actuated switches that are wired in parallel. Okay, the fan limit switch automatically turns the fan on and off based off of a preset temperature. Now, what's nice about the fan limit switch is we have the ability to adjust the temperature in which we want the fan to turn on and at what temperature we want the fan to turn off. Okay, why do we have this? It's because it allows our heat exchanger to heat up before our fan comes on. Now, if we didn't have this feature, the fan would come on automatically at the call for heat. And when that happens, we can actually have, you know, cold drafts and people complaining that they got a cold breeze growing on them. So by having the fan limit switch on there, it delays the fan, and we're talking about the blower, inside the furnace from coming on right away. We're allowing the furnace to heat up to approximately somewhere maybe around 140 degrees before the blower fan comes on. The switch also uh, has a delay in shutting the blower down as well. So this, what this does, it allows the heat exchanger time to cool off and dissipate the furnace heat at the end of a cycle. Now, usually on a lot of our fan limit switches, our blower will turn off once the furnace reaches around 100 degrees. The temperature sensing element in the switch is called a bimetal helix. It's basically two dissimilar metals that are kind of welded together and they create like a spiral. As the bimetal helix expands and contracts, it opens and closes a set of switches or a set of contacts inside there. Okay, That bimetal helix is located in the airstream near the heat exchanger. Because again, that's where our hottest temperature is going to be, is right where that heat exchanger is. So when the furnace turns on, the air is heated, that bimetal helix is now going to expand and it's going to close the contacts which is going to turn on our fan. The limit side of this device is the safety. We want this device to de-energize our burner in the event that we get too hot. For example, like if the fan doesn't turn on for some reason. Say we have a bad capacitor or we have a bad winding in our blower motor. We want to be able to shut the burner down so that we don't create a fire. Okay? If the fan does not come on or if there is another problem causing the heat exchanger to overheat, that limit switch will open its contacts, which will now shut off the power to your gas valve, rendering that system inoperative. Now, in this picture here, it's a, it's a wiring diagram of a oil-fired furnace, but what I want everybody to focus on is that nice red uh, square that we see on this diagram. Let's look at how this is actually wired, okay? So here we are. We have two thermostatically activated switches wired in parallel. I have power coming in to my fan limit switch. Power is going to go that way and power is going to go this way. Now here is my fan side of my switch. This is what we were talking about when the furnace gets up to about 140, maybe 150 degrees, depending on what we set our fan limit switch to. That switch is now going to close Notice in this diagram, it is a normally open switch. This is a normally closed switch. So when this furnace gets to about that temperature, that switch is going to 
close. And when it does, it is now going to turn on my fan motor so that I can now start blowing air across the heat exchanger and into the conditioned space. If the furnace gets too hot, 200 degrees, I have my limit side of my fan limit switch. If it gets too hot, my normally closed switch, which is right here, is going to open. And when it opens, it is now going to de-energize my burner circuit. Okay, so this would be like my gas valve that is over here. My ignition module. Okay, my ignition sequence is what's going to be shut off, off of this switch. Now, once my furnace has satisfied and the call for heat has ceased, my blower is still going to run. It's going to run for a moment of period of time because I still have heat sitting inside my heat exchanger. It's going to run until my furnace reaches around 100 degrees. At approximately 100 degrees, my fan switch on my fan limit switch is now going to open. And when it opens, it shuts off my fan motor. This is what the fan limit switch will actually look like. You will have three little knobs that we can adjust to set my fan off temperature, which is usually the very first knob that you see, my fan on knob, which is the second, and then the very last one is my limit, my safety. We do not usually touch that knob. That knob stays right where it's set, and it's usually at 200 degrees. Okay, so if I want my fan to turn on at, say, 150 degrees, I would just simply move this knob up to 150 degrees and set it. Usually they have a little white push button on them, and that is your auto and manual switch that, auto, that manually closes the fan switch on the fan limit switch in the event that you have to turn the blower on to quickly dissipate any sort of heat or even test the contacts on this uh, device. Uh, usually when we have these in a furnace, the white knob is pushed out, which will put it in the auto position, which means that the contacts will change over and close based off of temperature. We're not manually doing it. Here we have a couple of different limit switches. They look different, but they all operate the same. The way you are able to figure out whether you're dealing with a high limit switch or a rollout switch is physically looking at its location on the burner. Okay, remember, rollout switches are going to be located close to your burners. Your high limit switches are going to be located close to your heat exchanger. Okay, another device that you may run into is what we call a sail switch. Okay, it looks exactly as its name. Okay, it has a sail at the end of it along with a small little shaft. Okay, it is usually installed in a flue pipe. Okay, and what the sail switch does, it senses the draft. It senses any sort of air movement going on through the flue pipe. Okay, it senses the inducer motor operation. So what it is, it's a proving switch. It proves that you have a clear path for your flue gases to escape the furnace. Are they common in every single piece of equipment? No, they are not. But you may or may not run, may or may not see them. Okay, it depends on uh, where you're, what you're working on. Will you run into them on a lot of, on some rooftop units? Yes. Okay, they are there, and sometimes they can be a nuisance, um, especially if they're out in the elements. Uh, they do get rusty. They start to fall apart in some cases. Uh, the contacts get corroded, and sometimes they do create 
nuisance service costs. So really how this switch operates is as air passes across the, the sail, this little piece right here, it pushes down onto a, a, like a, a button. And that button basically closes the contacts that are inside. And it basically shows that you have a draft going on inside your flue pipe. Okay, so on a call for heat, the inducer motor starts, which has a to prove a draft in the flue. The draft pushes that sail, which makes contact with the switch. The switch closes, sending power to your gas valve or ignition control, thus turning on your heating cycle. They can also be found in ductwork on some cases to prove enough airflow is being supplied. And if not, it shuts off your, your system. It shuts it down. Another device that we were going to most likely see in a lot of our high efficiency furnaces is the pressure switch. Okay, the pressure switch is a safety device that is located near your draft inducer motor of a gas furnace. Okay, the switch is there simply to prevent the furnace from running unless the correct venting air pressure is present. So, the pressure switch is designed to sense the negative pressure created by the draft inducer motor during the furnace startup and to shut down the furnace ignition if the air pressure is not correct or inadequate. Okay. When we look at our pressure switches, you'll see then they will have like a number on them. Like in this case here, you have negative point, uh, negative 1.74. So in order for that pressure switch to close, my inducer motor needs to be able to create a pressure difference of at least negative 1.74 inches of water column. Uh, if it does not have, if it doesn't create enough draft or enough pressure difference, that switch is not going to close. Ways to check our draft and making sure that we have enough of it is we can actually use a manometer. You can connect a manometer to your pressure uh, switch, which will give you a reading of how much draft you are actually pulling through your your pressure switch and if it's not enough you're going to have to investigate further as to why you do not have enough uh, draft so as the uh, basically the operation of this device between our draft inducer and our pressure switch is really kind of simple the draft inducer motor is a blower that creates a flow of combustion air through the furnace's heat exchanger to make sure all of our combustion exhaust products are vented outside of the home through our flue pipe. Okay, so during combustion, the combustion blower creates an air pressure that is less than atmospheric, okay, which is basically a negative pressure between the inlet side of the combustion blower and the inside of the burner box of the furnace. So what is happening is, is the pressure switch, which is normally open, okay, switch is off, senses the drop in pressure and closes to complete that circuit, which means the switch is on, okay? Now, why will a pressure switch fail? Again, it could be a number of reasons why. Okay, but they can include simply due to the fact that the inducer motor has failed. Okay, uh, you can have a restricted intake uh, air vent if it's a high efficiency uh, furnace. You can have a restricted combustion air vent. You can have a, a restricted flue pipe. Uh, you can have leaks um, if a high efficiency furnace flue pipe um, venting system is, has a leak. A uh, cracked heat exchanger, for example, you may not be able to achieve uh, the correct pressures. Therefore, the, the vent pressure switch is not going to close. Uh, you can have a clogged condensate drain, especially if it's a condensing furnace. Uh, condensing furnaces need to be installed level and make sure that they are draining properly. Um, if they don't, the uh, <clears throat> drainage 
uh, system will actually fill up with water and it's not going to be able to make um, the correct draft and therefore your vent pressure switch isn't going to close. Uh, you can simply have electrical failure to the pressure switch. Um, your pressure switches can also just simply mechanically fail um, due to age, uh, corrosion, stuff like that. So really what you have to do when it comes to troubleshooting uh, pressure switches is you obviously you do have to use your meter. Uh, you're going to see whether or not that switch actually did open or close. I mean as you can see in the picture, I mean all it is is just two wires. Okay, so you're going to go right across those two terminals to see whether or not the switch is actually open or actually closed. Um, if you are in doubt, you are going to use a manometer to check your pressures to see whether or not you are actually achieving the correct inches of water column to make that switch close. Um, and if you can't, obviously you're going to look to see why that switch is not uh, closing properly.